Good evening. I'm Pamela Horn, Director of Cross-Platform Publishing and Strategic Partnerships for Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum. We're so pleased to welcome you all to this evening's design talk, Growing Local Designing Sustainable Food Businesses. So this evening, we'll hear from two influential and very visionary agents whose organizations champion social and economic empowerment, innovation, and environmental sustainability. Our first presenter will be Davida Davison, who serves as executive director at, De at Food Lab Detroit. Food Lab is a nonprofit organization that works to support local food entrepreneurs and imagines a new future for food justice. Davida accelerates locals with ideas for a food business to take their dreams into reality by connecting them with business advice, help with compliance and licensing, space in professional kitchens, marketing ideas, and more. Food Lab focuses on entrepreneurs and communities who have been traditionally under-resourced, under aiming to build power and resilience for people around the city. Food Lab's vision to use food as an economic engine, to form a supportive community of entrepreneurs, and to make good food for a reality for all Detroiters. Davida combines her passion for culinary arts with activism and entrepreneurship. She's worked with the Brooklyn Food Coalition. She's facilitated workshops for WKKF Foundation and spoken at TED 2017. And Davida writes on local food systems. Next, we'll hear from Keba Conte. Keba has invested his life as an artist, food entrepreneur, and community man. He's the founder of Chasing Lions Cafe and Red Bay Coffee Roasters. Through his work, he's embraced and hired people of all backgrounds and strives to be inclusive of those who have traditionally been left out of the specialty coffee industry, especially people of color, the formerly incarcerated, and women, as well as people with disabilities. Following their presentations, Davida and Cabo will be in conversation and will invite audience Q&A. So without further ado, please help me welcome Davida Davison to the stage. Robin, thank you so much um, for that um, introduction. And I uh, just want to say what an honor and a privilege it is um, to be here at Cooper Hewitt um, to talk about uh, design and how we're using design to grow the local economy in Detroit. And what I love about the conversation that um, Kaba and I are going to embark upon in our presentations is that you'll see how we're using design principles in two different ways. I use design in the systems that I create for Food Lab Detroit, and Kaba, well, he's an artist, so he uses design to create beautiful spaces. And so, again, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. And I think I would be remiss if I did not also share with you um, another way that we use design. So Ingrid LaFleur is in the audience, and she actually ran for mayor of the city of Detroit using design as a part of her campaign to promote Afrofuturism and what the city of Detroit would look like using design in her campaign. So we're all about design in Detroit. I don't know what y'all heard, but, but Detroit is, is really, really pushing the envelope when it comes to design. And so what I want to share with you um, for a few moments is I want to share with you what a food-based inclusive economy looks like. So what is a food-based inclusive economy? It's one that from farm to table, from processing all the way to composting ensures economic opportunity, high quality jobs with living wages, safe working conditions, access to healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, and is environmentally sustainable. And so for a few minutes, I want to share with you a story, a story about how Food Lab Detroit designed systems to support a community at scale of food businesses that are creating this food-based inclusive economy. And so, as it was already indicated, I am a daughter of Detroit, Michigan. I was born and raised in Detroit. 
and the city where I was born and raised in the 1950s was the world's industrial giant. It had a population in the 1950s of about 1.8 million people, and we had 140 square miles of infrastructure that was used to support this booming Midwestern center. This is a picture of the Packard plant in 1950. And now, just a half a century later, this is the Packard plant. And Detroit, unfortunately, has become somewhat of a poster child of urban decay. And as a result of this, Detroit is now a population that is no longer 1.8 million. Detroit has a population of about 680,000, of which 84% are African American. And due to decades of disinvestment in the city and capital flight that left the city for the suburbs, Detroit is severely lacking. It's lacking retail. And for me and the work that I do, I concentrate on the fact that Detroit is lacking fresh food retail. Because I know in a city that is lacking fresh food retail, there's a couple of things that occur. What occurs is that 70% of Detroit adults are obese and overweight and they struggle to easily access nutritious food that they need to stay healthy and to prevent premature diet-related diseases. I know that far too many Detroiters live closer to fast food restaurants and convenience stores and gas stations where they shop for food than they do full-service grocery stores. I know that you're more likely to find high-quality produce in our neighboring suburbs than you would in Detroit neighborhoods. And I know that all of this, in some ways, are distinguishing characteristics of my city. And I know that it's not a good story, but this is not the story that I've come to the Cooper Hewitt to tell. No, the story that I want to tell is a story about change and transformation through design and how urban agriculture and food entrepreneurship is changing the city of Detroit. And because of Detroit's history that I just shared with you, Detroit finds itself with some unique assets that is based around the design of the city. Because of the design of Detroit, it now has a lot of open land. I don't know how many people in this room knew that the topography of Detroit, Michigan, 140 square miles, that you can fit the entire city of Boston, the entire city of San Francisco, and the borough of Manhattan in the land area of the city of Detroit. And that estimates probably, folks are saying probably, of that land mass, 40 square miles of Detroit are vacant. That's a quarter to a third of the city. That's the design that we're working with. And that's a level of emptiness that creates a landscape unlike any other big city. But here are the assets that we have in Detroit. In Detroit, we have fertile soil. We are proximate to water. We have willing labor. And we have a desperate demand for fresh, healthy food, and that my friends, has created a people-powered grassroots movement in my city that's actively working to turn what was once the capital of American industry into what I want to call an agrarian paradise. In fact, if I could brag, I would say, and I know I'm a little biased, but the city of Detroit, I believe, out of all the cities in the world, Detroit may be best positioned and designed right now to serve as the world's urban exemplar food security and sustainable development. So let me make something perfectly clear. For those of us who are working in Detroit's urban agricultural movement, our goal is for the future of Detroit to be designed for us to create, us to create an ecosystem that will ensure that Detroit, Michigan becomes the most food secure and sustainable city on planet Earth. And I say us, because I believe that the work that we do at Food Lab Detroit is really leveraging the work of our urban agriculture and our farmers. And I think that the most innovative element of Food Lab Detroit, this incubator that incubates probably about 200 small business, the most innovative element about Food Lab Detroit can be summed up in this African proverb that says nothing about us without us is for us. And that design process is very important 
Because here's the thing. At Food Lab, we understand that many times what's missing from the design, the deployment, and the management of many of these kind of alternative food initiatives is any recognition that inequity in the food system is centrally linked to histories of racial and economic discrimination. Many programs often lack substantive participation from those community members who actually face the challenges of food injustice themselves. So what you have, if they are not centered in the design process, what you will get is you'll get these alternative food initiatives that tend to benefit mostly white folks who are already economically secure and already healthy. If you don't design a system that puts those who are most infected or affected in the middle. So what we at Food Lab have decided to do is that we want to put those individuals, entrepreneurs, community leaders, activists, in the center of our design. So we've created what we call an equity framework. We have an equity profile. And that informs our design process, which has resulted in developing tools that allow us to develop a set of what we call community-based solutions that might help transform the very political and economic systems that had historically oppressed low-income and ethnic minority communities across Detroit. So in my, in my last few minutes, what I want to do is I want to take you inside a Food Lab's process. And I want to show you the results of what it looks like when you design a system that sets out to empower local small business leaders to move the needle for poor communities of people of color. Let me take you into our process. The very first thing you have to do when you are designing a process or a methodology that we like to consider at Food Lab, design thinking, and that it requires empathy. That's the first thing. It's important to understand the user. You need to see the solution from the user's perspective. This is a picture of Detroit Vegan Soul. Why is this so important? Because the user of Detroit Vegan Soul, the consumer of Detroit Vegan Soul, were the founders of Detroit Vegan Soul. Erica and Kirsten founded Detroit Vegan Soul because based upon their reality, their parents themselves, they were suffering from high blood pressure, diabetes. And so they wanted to create a vegan soul food restaurant that was very much about culture, still keeping that soul food element, but taking a plant-based approach and making soul food vegan and still having the flavor of it. They were the user, so they designed a restaurant based around what they were experiencing for themselves. They first opened up a restaurant on the east side of Detroit. This picture is their second location on the west side of Detroit. They're also working on a third location in Detroit. It is because when you design a, if you have a problem and you design a solution with the user in mind and you are the user and you're speaking to a community, this is how you can grow and scale a business. The second kind of philosophy that we take a look at in our design process is that design thinking requires the ability to put across a story. It is an iterative process and it requires the understanding of the problem. You have to not only understand the problem, but you have also have constantly got to be looking for solutions. And you can't do that by not talking and thinking um, with other people. So this is what we did at Food Lab. We knew there was a problem, but we knew that we could also find a solution. What was the problem? Well, in Detroit, we have over 1,500 urban gardens and farms in the city of Detroit. And we work with one of our sister organizations that's called Keep Growing Detroit. They do for farmers what Food Lab does for entrepreneurs. And these are farmers in the city of Detroit who want to not only farm, but they want to make farming an economical, viable business model for them. They want to live off of farming. And so there was a problem. And the problem was is that many of the farmers, as they were growing, they did not have a market where they could sell their produce. Outside of maybe farmers markets or maybe community markets, they wanted to create other markets. So this is where Food Lab came in. Keep Growing Detroit and Food Lab came together and we said to ourselves, there's a problem. We need to grow the market for Detroit farmers. So we created a program that was called Detroit Grown and Made. That program is when Food Lab entrepreneurs who are growing and scaling their business locally source their produce from Detroit farmers. 
and Food Lab serves as a supply intermediary between the farmer and the entrepreneur. This is a picture of one of our entrepreneurs who locally sources some Michigan wild ginger from a farmer who grows nothing but ginger for Jess McClary. And what does she do? She uses this in her what we call consumer packaged good, which is called McClary Bros. It's a tasting vinegar. It's a cocktail shrub. You can use it for marinades, you can make vinaigrettes, or can, you can use it in a cocktail for an old-fashioned cocktail. As a matter of fact, it was just picked up from a national retailer called West Elm. So you can now find McClary Bros at West Elm. And here's the thing. This is where design thinking comes in, right? If you pull one lever, what happens on the other side? It's called a rising tide lifts all boats. So as Jess McClary begins to grow her business, right? She's now in 195 stores across the country, 22 states. What do you think that does for the farmers in Detroit where she locally sources her products from, right? As she does well, they do well also. But we weren't able to find a solution to that problem until you sit down the entrepreneur and you sit down the and farmer and they build relationships and figure out how to work together. The third really, really important component in our design process at Food Lab is that when we are designing systems, we intentionally put together what we call unlikely bedfellows, people who would have never met if it wasn't for the fact that they were a part of Food Lab Detroit. They bring together diverse perspectives, many of them who have never worked together. But when they begin to talk, when they begin to work together, they find out that there are more differences between, them. there are more things that they have in common than they do differences. This is a picture of April Anderson, who owns Good Cakes and Bakes, and Shannon Bird, who owns Slow Jams. Shannon has a jam company. April has a brick and mortar that's called Good Cakes and Bakes that's on Liver Noise. The thing that they found out that they have in common in this particular work group that we were having is that they both hire individuals who have high barriers to unemployment, and they both happen to be men. Shannon was bringing on young men, training them uh, who had been high school dropouts. April was hiring men who were returning citizens coming back into the commu community. And they did not realize that they could form a training program where they could work together to hire and also train food, not only to be to grow in their businesses, but offer good jobs as well for both Slow Jam and also Good Cakes and Bakes. But that doesn't happen unless you design a process where you are intentionally putting people together in the same room so they can talk. And I would say that the last thing that was important, not the last thing, but the second to last thing that I think is most important is humility. Every year, Food Lab entrepreneurs, we all come together as something what we call our annual membership summit. And sometimes the problems and the challenges can be so overwhelming for one food entrepreneur that they may not be able to see the, see the light at the end of the tunnel. But humility is so important. And that is that you have to have an attitude that allows you to go for a, a preconceived notion about not what's impossible, but what is possible. And so we bring our entrepreneurs together. And what we do is we vision together. And we know that when we work together, what one entrepreneur may not be able to do on their own, they ask for help from the community. And we decide on one project that we're going to work together as a community to move it forward so they can see the possibility of what they thought was impossible. And then once you have a design process and you've gone through and you designed a process and you've done some type of iteration and you put it on paper, I think the most important thing you have to do in a design process is you got to prototype the thing. you got to see if it works. And one of the things, the way food entrepreneurs prototype is that we do pop-ups. Here's a picture of Mako and her partner, and what you see behind her is an Airstream. And so Mako does pop-ups at a farm. That's called, uh, the farm is um, land in Corktown, but the name of her Airstream trailer and her business is called Pink Flamingos. So she doesn't have a restaurant. What she does is she pops up out of her Airstream on every Thursday. She's working toward a restaurant. She's trying to get consumer validation. She's trying to analyze the market. She's trying to test out her menu. She's trying to see who her consumer is. It is prototyping an idea before you do the full-fledged launch of that. And here's the deal. 
Food Lab Detroit, it can, we consist of about 200 small locally owned food businesses, burgeoning food entrepreneurs. We provide hands-on education, resources to help these entrepreneurs start and scale healthy food businesses. Last year alone, these small businesses, they generated almost $8.2 million in annual revenue, and they hired about 252 Detroiters and provided jobs for Detroiters, right? This is how you build a local economic development and community development strategy. And I know the examples that I've given you, Good Cakes and Bakes, Detroit Vegan Soul, Slow Jam, these are just a small examples. But these are stories about how you begin to build an ecosystem that creates an economy in a places and spaces that were left vacant by the disintegration of the old. And more importantly, this is how you also build participation amongst those individuals who are building businesses and want to create a community. And so last but not least, what I'll say is that I am not here to tell you that designing a system within Food Lab is the end all and be all solution in Detroit. We have several challenges in the city of Detroit. I am just a player in the ecosystem. But here's what I believe. I believe that strengthening the social fabric of your city and jump-starting local entrepreneurship, it all begins with sitting around the table, talking, designing a system for folks who are not only growing, who are cooking, who are serving fresh, healthy, nutritious, and delicious food. Thank you. Thank you, Lapita. If I was in Detroit, I would be all up in some food lab. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my name is Keba Conte. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Bay Coffee Roasters in Oakland, California. I'm about four years old. And I'm going to walk you through three design projects. Um, so Really, I, I appreciated Davida's um, talk because it really went, you know, uh, from the, it was the macro, the big picture, right? So in, if there was a food lab in Oakland, we would be one of those entrepreneurs. Um, so this is sort of like narrowing down on the macro of, of one, potent, one entrepreneurial story <clears throat> and, and how we're trying to make a difference in our community. My background is that of an artist and a food entrepreneur, um, and an activist. Red Bay Coffee, at Red Bay Coffee, we, we um, strive to develop, um, you know, beautiful coffees, uh, sustainable communities, um, and we do that through, through keeping our eyes on, on focusing on creating um, opportunities within our community in general, and in particular, you know, developing uh, single origin coffees, sustainable, organic um, coffees, and that's, and that's the business that we create. If you love something enough, it will reveal its secrets to you. This is a quote by George Washington Carver, and it has guided my my inquis inquisition into developing uh, in my, my research into coffee. And, <clears throat> and that's exactly what I, what I needed to do um, four years ago, five years ago, when I began to roast coffee and learn that side of it. Up to that point, I had um, operated coffee shops, um, Gorilla Cafe, Chasing Lions Cafe, decided to take a step back into the food value chain and to learn how to roast coffee. So to do that, um, I needed a, a space. And luckily, I had a room in my garage. And, <clears throat> and I applied, and I developed this room in, into a coffee dojo. A dojo is Japanese for a room where you 
train in your arts, martial arts, but in this case, the culinary arts. So this was the room. Um, it was um, storage, a storage room surrounded by a garden in our yard, uh, in our home in the Fruitvale District. So much like my artwork, one of my design principles, um, of building principles, is by using salvaged materials, wood, um, you know, fixtures whenever, um, I, whenever I can. So the door, so this door, this room, is about six foot tall, and depending on the shoes I'm wearing, I'll be about six foot tall. So, so a lot of people would knock their head when they walk through here. So at first I wrote the word duck, and then I was, I was like, no, how about bow? And you know, so sometimes we have design challenges, and it's really, it's it's really just the perspective that we bring to to work through, to work through there, and. The angel is in the details, you know, so it's a lot of fun to, 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 to play with the details. So I don't know if you, everyone reckon, <clears throat> recognizes this tool, but it's what the barista will use to tamp down the coffee when they pull a shot of espresso, and it's a door handle. Um, so once we built it, now it's time to start training. So this is Solomon Tyson, my coffee roasting apprentice who started in an after-school arts program uh, where we met, and, and we became friends in, in training in martial arts, um, <clears throat> which is unique because he's in a wheelchair. Um, but he had a, he, had a, he had a sense for it, and so we, we became friends in that, in that context. Um, he got a job as a cashier at uh, Chasing Lions Cafe, and then as a barista, he was the only one there drinking straight espresso. So I knew he was developing his palate. I invited him to be my roasting apprentice um, in the dojo. And, you know, we're a big believer in each one, teach one. So what we do um, is we roast, we taste, evaluate, adjust, and repeat until we created the, the flavor profiles that we needed to replace the coffees that were in each of my coffee shops. So at the time that we birthed Red Bay Coffee, I had two coffee shops and our highest um, invoice was that of our coffee producers, or of our coffee roasters. So, so you know, but I chose two of the best coffee roasters in our area, which is some of the best coffee in the world in Northern California is a very competitive environment. So I had a very high bar to create, to pass in order to, you know, to, to, to enter that market. Um, they're my own coffee, they're on my own coffee shops, but still I needed to step up properly. So we would roast and, and, and develop and train in the dojo until we've got results that we feel like we could present. So, you know, once me and Solomon worked through that process, then we got to work and started producing and started to, to scale up. So this was the place that we would develop the profiles. We had a sort of a, a commercial kitchen where we can go out and, and, um, and produce in larger scales. We would come here, bag it up, um, and, and deliver it. We we um, developed and run the business out of the dojo for the first almost two years. Um, and we had eight, scaled up to eight employees in that one little room um, and, you know, sharing some space in the house sometimes. Um, so that was pretty close quarters. So that's the dojo. So we grew, grew our business initially with the um, wholesale accounts into restaurants and, and grocery stores. And then it was time to begin our very first coffee, coffee shop. Um, so we got an invitation from uh, our friends at the Impact Hub Oakland, which is uptown Oakland in a development called The Hive. 
There's a barber shop, a bakery, restaurants, and housing. So, so we designed a coffee bar that would be outside in the middle of this plaza. Um, so the design idea there was to create a shop that would one, um, reflect Oakland's past and present culture uh, at the same time as addressing some of the challenges that are in our city. Um, so first, the physical design of the space. So Oakland, among many other things, is a port town. Um, much of the goods coming through the western half of this country come through the port of Oakland, uh, and that includes coffee. So we designed it, we started with a shipping container. So, so this was the shipping container, and, um, and you can see even the shape of that awning reflects the iconic Oakland shipping cranes um, that were very inspiring to many creatives, um, such as some of the, um, the, the Star Trek movies, I mean Star Wars movies. So this was just a mock-up. Um, and what we did here was we ran a, a crowdfunding platform to create the funds in order to launch this business. I had a lot of apprehension about running a campaign to just start my own business. Um, but to address one of the other challenges in Oakland, which was, um, which, is, which is gentrification, um, a lack of affordable, uh, well-paying jobs. I thought, well, how can we create, you know, we get, I mean, all right, we created something really cool looking in a great location um, with repurposed materials, a salvage shipping container, but at the end of the day, there were still just low-wage service jobs. So I thought, well, how, you know, what difference? It's just going to be another coffee shop. So how are we, how could we build a business where the workers could keep the profits? Now that would be something interesting, but you know, but if you're a coffee shop and you're, you know, spending your savings or taking loans or investments, really there's not much profit to share there. So that's why we went to the uh, crowdfunding. And at that time, uh, the highest amount ever raised for a coffee project in the coffee category and Kickstarter was $50,000. We needed much more than that. Uh, we set our goal at 80,000. Um, many of, many of uh, folks on my team thought, bring that down, that's too much. Lower goal, overshoot it. I'm like, look, we're gonna go for 80 and we still need to overshoot that. So we raised $88,000 on Kickstarter shattered all the previous records in the coffee category, and, um, and we put this thing to work. So after design, you know, we actually built it. So this is them delivering it. You'll see this is the hive, the barbershop, the residential stuff in the background, the platforms, the little foundational stuff there. Um, now it's landed. We're putting the final design touches on, painting our logo on the outside. <clears throat> we are you know, putting artwork on the inside. This is an uh, example of some, some of the, my previous artwork, some of the medium that I do, which is photographic transfers on wood. Also, um, a reference to some of the badassery culture of East Oakland and, you know. Um, so we, we hired, you know, we hired our team um, at that time, you know, before we're opening, we're training, we're cleaning the box. Um, Half of the folks we hired were formerly incarcerated or former foster youth. And um, then we opened for business. So not long ago, uh, earlier this year, uh, we caught the attention of BuzzFeed. They did a 60 second video um, on our box and um, it garnered over three quarters of a million views. Um, and you know, and it just continues to be sort of an iconic location in uptown Oakland. 
um, also enables us to practice the cooperative economics that we talk about. So we found a baker, local baker, uh, patisserie, uh, an African-American woman doing some incredible sweet and savory pies. Um, this is our own um, cold brewed coffee and handmade signs in the back. So each one of our wholesale accounts gets a handmade sign <clears throat> that we build and burn and s screen print. This is um, some of the staff at the box and also at, the, at, the, at our company, Red Bay Coffee. So got the, you, you've seen the dojo, you've seen our first retail spot. So now we're outgrowing the dojo. Uh, we're busting at the seams, actually. And so it's time to you know, build our headquarters. We were looking for a building to buy. Really, we couldn't find anything quite what we were looking for. We, we lucked out and found a place for lease um, right in our own neighborhood. Um, and yeah, so this is the space that we found. It is uh, 6,000 square feet. And so this is pretty much what it was that we walked into. Um, and this is current, current day. Um, so when you, when you hit the door, you stand right here, you're basically able to see the entire operation. Our offices to the left, the coffee roaster right in front of you. You know, there's a production space in the far back center. You know, you'll see a better shot of it later, but that's the, the lab, um, the coffee bar is there. And it doesn't take long for the community to find out that there's a space. Um, inevitably, there's just always a demand for venues in a space. So we've opened that up from the very beginning. And um, so we regularly have lectures, performances. Uh, we've had five weddings there already. Um, and just recently, we opened up the coffee bar. So, you know, really, the, our primary business is roasting, packaging, and delivering coffee, developing, doing our work. I thought it was important, one, because we had the space, but two, I think what the coffee bar does is it brings people into the space. It um, allows people to see the process, um, sort of as a transparent production, manufacturing, and retail all in one. This is, uh, these are the cool coffee kids, uh, I call them. So this is the roasting team. So next to me, that's uh, Solomon Tyson, who started, you know, you've heard his story, but now he's our lead production roaster. And that's uh, next to him to his right is Khalib Houston, who really was, um, he, he, be he became our first director of coffee. Um, his experience was really an expert in chocolate. So he worked for one of the specialty chocolate uh, manufacturers in San Francisco uh, when I headhunted him from that spot. And he's since uh, went back to school to study architecture. Um, so um, to his credit, he tapped and introduced me to Alicia Adams to his right. And she is our new director of coffee. And, um, and as much as I love Khalib, man, she's better. <laughs> she's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Khalid brought us so far, but Alicia Adams really took it to the next level. She's uh, only been with Red Bay for a few months now, but she's just lifted our entire, you know, catalog of coffees and refined them. And just, you know, she had years of experience uh, trained in Boston at a, at a hospital uh, in a research lab and then got into coffee there, became a, really a top-notch barista. Um, and then got into the industry on the far other side, uh, green coffee importer, um, quality control. So she was, then she was just in a laboratory tasting and scoring and evaluating coffee all day. So it was really two ends of the spectrum. Um, and now she's um, developing that middle piece, which is profiling, developing um, coffee profiles and, and roasting on that machine right there. So, um, in the very first slide, you saw an altar to George Washington Carver. So that really was the inspiration to, to sort of have us discover and, and learn more about coffee. So that altar just never found a place in the headquarters, but 
we created another altar. Uh, and this time it was an altar to Africa itself. And Africa, this is an homage to really the birthplace of coffee. So, you know, coffee is Africa's gift to the world. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so with the help of my friend on the ladder, Yael, she is the founder of uh, Verde 360. Verde 360, she is amazing, she's a genius. She's built these um, green walls um, in, uh, in Mexico City and roofs and walls, monumental scale. I mean, five stories for a block long. I mean, phenomenal, look her up. They've got a great collection of her work on, on the Facebook page. Um, and this is my man, Marvin, who is my, my friend, next door neighbor, and just a great builder. And he's kind of had his hands building on almost anything in there. So basically what you see here, we, we did um, a rubber seal against the back wall. There were these grids that we started the succulents in outside. There are some tracks. We put them there, built the frame around, and then we'll put planks you know, around you know, um, the rest of that wall there. And those planks are, this is us outside. Um, one of the nephews uh, burning the, the planks with the torch, all salvaged wood. And, and that's, the, that's the finished piece. Um, so it's a living wall, it's a living altar, and it's the, the people, you know, are, are up on that altar. Um, and in this particular photo, this is when David Robinson came to um, this is David Robinson, um, the, the son of Brooklyn's own Jackie Robinson. Um, and he has been growing coffee in Tanzania for 30 years, just quietly, humbly doing, making a contribution to the world. He wanted to have an impact on farmers, but knew he needed to become one first, then formed a cooperative called Sweet Unity Farms. Um, I read about him, made contact, he reached right back. I met him in New York. His coffee was absolutely delicious. And we reached out and, and we bought a full shipping container full of his coffee at a time. That's, 300, that's 320 bags. At the time, we were just buying like four to six bags at a time. Wow. So we really took a leap of faith that our business was going to grow. Um, and, you know, and, and, much, and later on during the process, we brought him out for this coffee roasting residency. He stayed with me for a week and learned how to roast coffee. You know, the thing is in, in the coffee industry, a lot of people work in silos. So he's a great coffee grower, but you know, we, I, I figured if he's learning on how to roast and taste coffee, then that may help him, you know, give him feedback on, on and who knows, maybe it could help him and it for sure helped us understand the process. And these are also other coffee producers from Ethiopia and Yemen. Young Gifted and Black, one of our, you know, if you haven't heard these, they are phenomenal. Uh, but anyway, so, so, but this is, you know, a, a living altar. So it, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, this is inside the lab looking out. And um, those windows in the back were big recycled doors, uh, glass doors. Now they're horizontal, we framed them out, and uh, Marvin made them into windows. Um, we built this adjustable height table. Um, the gentleman in, in the middle is, uh, is a coffee producer from Yemen. The sister on the right is a coffee producer from Burundi, East Africa, uh, and that's Alicia Adams, our director of coffee on the left. And this is sort of what it looks like today. So we have all this space. We open it up into a co-working space, um, which is really what the cafes were, right? The original co-working spaces. So there's no membership. Just get a cup of coffee, come hang out, spend time, you know. And what happens is when folks gather in a community, um, in the coffee place, around coffee, what happens is they bring intel, they bring you know connections. They they start to build and and those creative juices are are, are going and um, you know yeah we could talk more about that later. But um, 
So what you just saw was the beginning of Red Bay Coffee in the, in the garage, through our first retail space, in the module shipping container. Um, and now this is the, the headquarters in the roastery, Red Bay Coffee. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Um, I, I first want to uh, tell uh, the, the Cooper Hewitt staff, um, thank you so much, Rob and Susanna. I mean, just thank you so much. When um, I got the call um, for, uh, to have the opportunity for this event um, and then had the opportunity um, to reach out to Kaba to mm -hmm. ask him to join me. I, I'm such a huge fan. Like, you should have just seen my head. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I know this person. I know that. <laughs> yes, because, I mean, I'm in the Bay Area. Yeah. We have friends in the Bay yes, Area. Sure yeah. I am a huge fan of your work. Um, mm -hmm. I love Red Bay. I have talked about you in presentations and talks that I have given Too all much. around the country. And Too so much. when the opportunity came out for us to actually be in conversation yeah. in the same room at the same time, yes. giving this impression, I was like, can we get game? And I He's said, in yes. California. And I said, Can yes. you come? Yeah, and sure. he was like, mm hmm. <laughs> and he said, yes. So thank you. Yes, you were Thank welcome. you so I appreciate much. appreciate the invitation. Yes. And I hope y'all got that. I gave the mic, the kind of 33,000 kind of foot in the air of terms of how we're helping to grow and cultivate sustainable businesses in Detroit from a design process in terms of our systems and how we think. And then Cable brought it right down to the macro in terms of how he's applying design. And so I don't really want to take up too much time in our conversation because I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Yeah, but one of the things that I do want to ask, because there is another organization in the Bay Area that I absolutely love um, as well, and it is Fun Good Jobs, Inner yep. City Advisor. And what I want to say, Kaba, is that the work that you and I do is so intersectional. It's about more than just food. It's about more than just beverage. It's about community. Mm -hmm. It's about hiring kind of young people yeah. and people in the community. And I'm just wondering, when you set out on this journey of Red Bay, did you always think about that? Did you always think about the intersectionality of food? Um, absolutely, for sure. You know, I mean, really, we started... Um, like I started, I went to San Francisco State University in the late 80s and early 90s, and it was a very political time on that. It was a, it's a political campus, historically. Um, and so, and I was an activist. I was in South Africa doing photojournalism in 1994 when Mandela was elected. I, then I was in, the, you know, the, the, the National Mall during the Million Man March as a photojournalist and, and kind of pursuing these stories. Um, so, so, you know, I was always an activist and applying these values to, to the business, to my artwork. Um, so that's kind of where it began. So of course, you know, that's the first thing I would do. Um, and it really, it was just a natural out, outcrop of, of what I do. Right. So it was not easy. Very, not, not, but not a hard choice. Very easy. And I just, I just want to add uh, one other thing, too, and I want to ask this question. Um, and so currently, right now, um, in the city of, of Detroit, um, there's been a couple of reports um, that have been released. One, um, the um, policy link that's also out of the Bay Area did an equity profile of the city of Detroit. Detroit Future City, they did a kind of 130 square miles analysis, and then there was the Urban Institute that did a report about Detroit. And one of the things that really jumped out at me, of mm -hmm. all these different reports, there was one thing that was constant, and that was the poverty rate um, in the city of Detroit. When we talk about uh, adults in Detroit, about 40% live at or below poverty. And we talk about working poverty, it's about 63%. 57% um, of Detroit youth um, are at or below poverty and 20% of our seniors. And I mention that because there's this misnomer sometime, particularly in the food justice movement, that there is a scarcity issue around food or there is a lack of healthy food access, right? As there's an access issue. None of that is true. There's a poverty issue. Yes, and so so one of the things that I think that way that you're tackling poverty and the way that I am trying to sustainably and at scale grow food entrepreneurs in Detroit to think about poverty is to give folks a good 
job, mm -hmm. a good job in their community, in, in their neighborhood. And I, and I say that, Cable, because I am always amazed sometimes when I talk to folks, um, particularly non-folks of color, who say they can't find good help. In, in the community, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at some of the folks, if you've hired and found, these people of young people, people of color, they're amazing. The entrepreneurs that I work with in the neighborhood, they found the young people oh, that sure. are amazing. Is there Absolutely a secret amazing. to this thing? And Because <laughs> I know it's not, right? Because no, I'm thinking right. to myself, how is it that you're not finding young folks of color who are young people, but I know plenty of other people who are able to find them and train them. Yes. And, 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 and not only train them, but flourish. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, just wondering, what is so your So I think, you know, there's, there's a couple things. One, you have to be willing to train. Right. So especially if you're going into an industry that is already underrepresented. So inherently, there aren't going to be many experienced professionals just because that's so it'd be so easy to, you know, to just hire a lot of folks who look like the last all the other folks in that industry. So if you're trying to sort of rewrite that story, um, we have to be willing to train. Uh, we have to have that be the intention in the first place and just look harder. Um, and, you know, and it's going to take some luck also. Mm. But once, once you put that work in and you build some track record, then pretty soon people will know your organization that that's what you're about. Mm -hmm. And then the talent will come to you. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. you know, so, so now we're just inundated, you know, in, and you know, we still face the challenges of business, right? Just of everyday business of just of growing, of turning a profit. And the you know, the more we grow, the more we can hire, the more jobs we can create. Um, but yeah, it just comes start. It starts with intention. Mm -hmm. And my last question for you, Cable, and we can be in conversation. When I want to open it up to the audience, is that I'm wondering if you received this because this is um, sometimes not so much now that Food Lab has been doing this work for about four years, but I'm wondering if you received this. You know, we get pushback in the city of Detroit when food entrepreneurs want to go into um, under-resourced and marginalized areas and say, I want to open up a vegan sit-down uh, casual restaurant, or I want to do a, um, a, a coffee shop that is serving uh, uh, roasted um, cappuccinos or espresso, or I want to do a uh, fresh, healthy food, uh, kind of small, uh, micro, I'm going, you call them bodegas in Detroit, I mean, in, in New York, well, then Silicon Valley tried to call them bodegas and they're really a cabinet, oh, but no. anyway, um, oh, but, no. but, but these hyper-local stores, and the thing is, is that I, I've got to tell you, banks, some people in traditional economic development and community development will tell me, Davida, why, why, why do they want to open up a restaurant in, 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 in Fruitvale? Or why do they want to do that on the east side? Or why, as if, as if poor folks don't want to eat well or mm -hmm. don't want to sit down and, yeah. and, and drink coffee. I'm just wondering, did people look at you like you were crazy or give you pushback and you're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to do a coffee roast in a coffee bar in my community, in Fruitvale. Like, it, I mean... It's hard to raise money, no right. matter what. Right. I mean, no matter where you're gonna put it, you know. Um, so that's a whole conversation in itself, and I, I imagine we'll tap into that. But you know, raising money is very challenging, um, especially you know, they want to see. You know, I think the funders they want to see mostly that you have um, equity and collateral. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that they want to see, no matter where you put it. Uh, but you know, then they want to they want to see a record. They want to back another hit record, mm. right? If that movie was a hit, they want to make part two, right? If that song was a hit, they want to make, you know, the remix of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, whenever you're trying to do something new and some, break some new ground, you're always going to get um, pushed back from the, from the money people and sometimes even the community, within the community as well. That's true. Yeah. Well, let's open it up to Q&A. What you think? Okay. Cool. Sounds good. Any questions? Great. So I have the mic if anybody has a question. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll start. So that's a, that is um, a great question. And so and I think that um, for us in Detroit, um, in order to really grow this ecosystem at scale that we have, we could not have done it um, by ourselves. So yes, we have had collaboration um, from um, government and also um, from philanthropy. So I'll give you an example of how government dollars has helped us to kind of grow this ecosystem. And so there was one point in time in this country where we had a competent person who was at HUD. And so, um, listen, the person who's at HUD now is from Detroit, but we're not even gonna acknowledge that. Um, and so, but, but it's important to have competent people in government. And the reason being is because HUD oversaw um, something that is called um, CBG funds. CBG is Community Block Grant Funding. And the Community Block Grant Funding that the Obama administration earmarked um, for communities in the city of Detroit. That funding had been able to trickle down to um, a entity in the, in the city of Detroit that is called the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. They took that funding and with that funding from CBG grants uh, or CBG funding, they turned it into grants. And what those grants did was they were able then to take kind of like old, um, unused uh, real estate, commercial real estate and do what's called white box those, real, those spaces. And when they white box those, those spaces, they allowed entrepreneurs to do what's called pop up in those spaces to test their product, mm -hmm. to, see if the, to see if the community would like it, to get market validation, to kind of understand their business model. And they were able to stay in many cases in those spaces for six months and maybe nine months. And if it really took off, then they were able to negotiate a lease with the landlord. That's how Kirsten and Erica were able to start Detroit Vegan Soul. They were in a pop up through what was called the Revolver Program. And the Revolver Program was funded through CBG grant dollars from the federal government. There is another um, program too that we were able to tap into a federal program and that program is called HFFI which is Healthy Food Financing Initiatives and what HFFI was able to do is they were able to set aside dollars particularly for food entrepreneurs that were actually building and creating and starting healthy food businesses in their communities and neighborhood and they were able to access funding. And so an organization in, this, in, in Detroit metropolitan area who was able to hold some of that HFFI funding for us was an um, organization called Fair Food Network. And they created something that was called the Michigan Good Food Fund. And the Michigan Good Food Fund then kind of distributed uh, that money out through um, low interest loans um, to entrepreneurs who were creating good, good food businesses. So yes, not only did we have federal dollars, but we also you know, had partnership with the city. We had partnerships with foundations, WKKF, which is the Kellogg Foundation, um, uh, the Certain Foundation, um, Kresge Foundation, and um, we could not do this alone. So, I, 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 like I said, I'm a part of an ecosystem of partners that I work with. But that was a great question. Have you a been able to access any federal dollars or no. local? Oh. <laughs> but I got I'm a short a, answer. To right, that. I'm a nonprofit, so I'm a little. Yeah, I, yeah, so yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. A nonprofit is yeah. it was a little bit different. But did that answer yeah. your question, sir? They're in jeopardy. I'm just going to say it like that. It's a question in the back. Yep. I actually have uh, two questions. These are things that are very close to my heart. I run two sustainable restaurants in New York City. Um, one thing that I find is that it's hard to sort of one of our mission statements, apart from running a sustainable restaurant, is to be able to offer that type of food to as many people as possible rather than to the 1% or um, and so it's, I find it hard to combine both sourcing really, really well locally and, and supporting other businesses that are doing everything right while, and paying fair wages and keeping prices so that, you know, we're in a gentrifying neighborhood. We're in the south side of Williamsburg and I, we've been there for a while and I want to feed everyone that's been there for 30 years and also all of the new construction. And so that's something I'm always kind of, you know, it's hard to have healthy, you know, well-sourced food, pay everyone well, uh, you know, use the right kind of energy and also keep it low enough so that everyone can participate. Um, and the other thing is a little bit, uh, is, is on another um, subject, but I find it when people hear about our sustainable practices and everything we stand for, they're really excited, but it's a little bit preaching to the choir. Um, and also, 
I don't find that that actually brings people into the restaurant. The people that are already there, that already follow us and love what we do, are excited to know about it. But in far as as using that as a tool to like bring new people in, you know, I sort of say the rainbow bagel or the you know the the busting egg yolk is is somehow so much more. Um, appealing, and so I'll, I don't know if you had any experience with that. I'm curious to know if that's something you use in your marketing, or, or is that just in the back end? Well, um, I'll take a stab at some of those topics. Um, in terms of you know really positioning and com the, what we how we communicate uh, our business, like I mentioned, coffee and especially coffee in Northern California in the Bay Area is really competitive. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot um, of our mission statement that we could speak on, and we usually get there, but, you know, my own bias as a consumer is when, you know, and I'm not sure if this is 100% the right path, but when I, when I see a product that is sort of overly leaning on their mission, um, in my back of my head, I doubt that, that the, it's a product that's a, really built around excellence. Uh, first, so so, and and to be in such a competitive environment, you know, really, I when when we're trying to grow and sell, you know, our our business, we we talk about quality first. Uh, we talk about the extent that we go through to quality control and to to research and development, and you know, and we get into sort of the coffee porn, if you will, of it, um, and then we talk about you know, sort of a, as an add-on. Um, to discuss, you know, sort of the mission and the and the and the people power and the people work that we do um, around the environment and everything else. Um, in terms of your first question, you know, that's that um, that is a dilemma, you know, um, in terms of making quality products affordable, and that's just a hard, that's just hard to do. Um, so, you know, we've gotten, you know, maybe you're familiar with the suspended coffee um, phenomenon, I think, started in Italy, you know, and we, we practiced that where someone can come in and buy a cup of coffee for themselves and um, they can buy a cup of coffee for the next person behind them. Um, or, it's, you know, we have a little board and you can sort of just say, you know, there's a coffee for, you know, a, a student. And then if someone's a student, then they could sort of grab that. If it's a person that's wearing glasses, if it's a first, I mean, really you can make it as interesting or general as, as you like, but so that's, you know, just small things like that. So uh, suspended coffee. Um, so that's one thing to do. And, um, you know, and we just donate also. We donate a lot of coffee to, to, to charities, nonprofits for their auctions for, you know, and, um, you know, we, we share coffee with, with people who just come and ask for a coffee too, you know, so, um, you know, then they might say, oh, can I get some whipped cream on top too? I mean, so like, all right, come on, man, get your coffee. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, but no, they're, they're, they're challenging issues and, you know, and that's kind of how, how we've addressed it. Yeah, so I, I want to take a stab at, at your first um, question and, and I'm going to tell you, share with you a story. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing this work now um, for, for a couple years. And so I, I am now old enough to remember um, when Food Lab's founding members, who is, who's been with us since like 2012 and 2013, I can remember the excitement, the enthusiasm that they had um, around why they wanted to start this food business because they love cooking or because, like I said before, Kirsten and Erica knew that through veganism, they can help address some of the diet-related diseases and health problems and crises that they were having in their own family, but wanted to share that veganism love um, and also teach veganism to the community. And so I remember that, the energy and the excitement that they had around cooking. Fast forward, three to four years later, those same entrepreneurs, they come to me and they say to me, Davida, the very least thing that I do now in my business is cook. It's the very least to do. So 
I, I'm answering your question like this. When you talk about this challenge that you have around not only offering a quality product, but being able to like feed the masses. Number one, you can't be all things to all people. That's number one, you gotta realize that. But the second thing you have to do is that you have to get control over your cost, right? And figure out what I tell entrepreneurs now all the time, and I learned this for the entrepreneurs that I've seen grow and scale, is that it's not good enough to start a food business you have to create a model for your business. You have to create a business model. So I take Detroit Vegan Soul, for example, and they too come to me and they says, Davida, you know, our mission was to create a restaurant that served the best vegan food, that has that flavor, that love, that feeling of soul food in it. But how can we do it in a way where we're not preaching to the choir, when we're not just feeding the same people? We wanna, we wanna also, preach veganism or teach veganism to people who may not otherwise like even think about eating like seitan or, or tofu, right? And we'll look at us crazy if we like, really this tastes like catfish, but it's really tofu. Let me tell you what they had to do. No, they had to revamp their entire business and create a model. That's important. And I'm, I'm sorry, the, I think there's a lot of lessons that small businesses can learn from large businesses, seriously. And that's about model creation and creating systems. And so one of the things that they looked at is they looked at Trader Joe's. They're like, what's that Trader Joe model, right? Small square feet. You'll never find a huge Trader Joe's. They are very, very specific about the number of SKUs that they have in Trader Joe. And a lot of their SKUs are private label. So Kirsten and Erica thought, you know what? In order for us to cut down on our, what's called our cost of goods, and to be able to manage the operations of our business, so perhaps we can start bringing the price down of our menu items, there's a couple things we gotta do. Number one is, we've gotta curate a tight menu. We're not gonna try to have everything on the menu. We might do some soups, some salads, some sandwiches, some main entrees, that's it. That's it, that's all we could do. And the thing is, we're gonna curate a menu that we can use like one ingredient, six or seven different ways. So now we can buy that ingredient in bulk. And that lowers our cost of good. One of the things that we're gonna figure out number, way, number two is that how that can we use the envelope of our business to manage what we call the zones, right? And this is stuff they taught me because I'm like, whoa, I didn't even realize this. And the zones is kind of, are like, how are we managing refrigeration? Right? How are we making sure that we're managing the lights? Right? If somebody is not in this particular space, but the lights are still on, is that driving up our electricity? Like, so they figured out operationally like how to bring down the cost of running and operating a business so they can bring down the price and they can make it more approachable and more affordable to other people in the community. And so I say to you, like, really look at your business model and how you can look at perhaps driving down what they call the cost of goods and the cost to operate your business. In New York, I know that's like, I'm gonna use an Oakland phrase, I know that's like hella hard, right? Like I know that's difficult because real estate, and I'm, I don't know if you own your business, but I'm sure like your, your, your rent is like ridiculous. I don't even wanna know, because I'll probably bust out crying and if I even <laughs> knew how much you were paying a rent. But think of looking, you gotta, as a small business owner, I'm serious, you gotta look at every single penny and where it is going. This is a business with like really small margins. And then the second thing I would say, before we open up the, the, the question, is that one of the things that I love about what, what Cable's doing and Food Lab member is, our members are doing is they know that it's more than just the food. It's about community. So other than just like putting these uh, uh, menu items kind of like in the restaurant, how are you reaching out to the community? Detroit Vegan Soul does like healthy festivals and things of that nature. Like there's, there are ways in which they're like engaging communities. Like we're there, we want the community to know that you're a part of us, we're a part of you. This is home, man, this is where we live. This is my neighbor. I just hired your son. Like this, we all know one another. And, and so it's really important, like how are you making your presence known and your presence felt in that community? And, and Inger can tell you, because you know, Inger lives in Detroit, when Detroit Vegan Soul opened up their first location, even when they opened up their second location, the line was down the street, around the corner, because people felt a part of that restaurant, and they still do. How, are, they, are, you, are, they, are they following you on Instagram? Do they know your story? Like, how else are you reaching out to the community? Because I'm gonna tell you something, baby. You just can't build it and think they are gonna come. You gotta do the work to reach out to them. And when you do that, if you're in the churches or in the mosque or wherever the community is, at the parks, you know, in the community centers, that's how you reach the community. You gotta go where they are. 
and then they'll support you. So I hope that kind of well answers your question. That really did. I'd, I'd like to add one more piece of that. Um, yeah, that did deserve a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, wages, in terms of wages, we you know start our employees at fifteen dollars an hour, and that's before Oakland went up to twelve something. Um, and you know, and we do that for a couple reasons. Um, one, where you know we also sort of you know our our highest paid managers are paid a little less as well. But um, training and retraining is very expensive. So in the in the short term, you're you're looking at these costs, and you know, and and they are high, but also you have to be efficient, and there's a lot of efficiencies that you you, you can do. But it's the retraining, and when you're paying someone um, fifteen dollars an hour, when they know, you know, it might be nine dollars an hour might be the alternative, um, at at a place where they respect it, you know, it's a way to re retain. Uh, employees, and that's gonna just that's gonna create consistency in your business. It's gonna create sort of an institutional wisdom, um, and it's gonna help you retain those employees and save costs that way also. So sometimes things look expensive, um, and they are, but they could save you money in the long run. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. I learned so much. It's so inspiring, both of you. Um, so. This has been on my mind lately because of the hurricane season, and that's climate change, and ensuring cities are um, prepared for this shift. Uh, because Detroit, as Davida, you said, is surrounded by 20% of the freshest water uh, in the world, uh, we really have to think about um, population growth um, and uh, seasons changing. But when thinking about food security, um, I'm wondering how does climate change factor in, and especially as we're imagining futures and designing futures, um, as you know, we have all this vacant land, but also what we can grow and where it grows and how that changes over time. You know, where does that factor in in the now? Let me. I'm. I'm, I'm gonna let you take it. Um, but um, I just wanted to put in. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple things to that, um, Ingrid. Um, Cause it's, we were at um, Idea Cities over the weekend. And I think the conversation was about setting the table of the future. And, and Jeff, uh, the moderator had asked the, the, the question, what is the most, what, what they feel, what we feel urgent issue of food today. And I was really surprised when, when uh, uh, None of the panelists, who are dear friends of mine who I love, didn't really touch on um, climate change and didn't really touch on how that is going to affect the food that we eat. Here's the thing, Ingrid, that's the most important issue for me as I look at what Food Lab is doing uh, is there is so much brilliance. There is so much genius that lies in the food lab community with, with, with young people, I'm shocked and surprised. They are thinking about how climate is going to affect not only how we eat, but what we eat. There are entrepreneurs in the food lab community and even funders are looking at them like they're crazy, like what are you talking about? Who understand that if we don't do something right now about how we are consuming protein and that the fact that we can't not continue to raise, kill, and slaughter animals the way that we are doing now, we are gonna be in huge problems. So Intro Detroit, which is Anthony and Tim, they are looking at how to not only use crickets, but even in the city of Detroit, like how to grow them. Like they are now want to start like a, this cricket factory farm where they're like, you know, growing and manufacturing that's, that's like, 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 like crickets yeah. and using crickets as like a source of protein and making like cricket powder. Like so these young people are like thinking about this stuff. Here's another thing, and Ingrid, I know you know this too, is that not only are they thinking about f growing food, like how we're gonna consume it, but they're also thinking about growing like cannabis and how cannabis is also going to be used in like food products for medicinal reasons, right? How can you grow pro cannabis and like put it in your baked goods? Like seriously, they, they, they're thinking about this. And this is what a food entrepreneur told, no, this is a, this is a situation, this is for real. 
This, this happened. Just, I was just up at the University of Michigan, and I got my, my, one of my entrepreneurs got their wrist slapped for this. And, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of controversial um, because this entrepreneur is starting something that's called grass-fed bakery. And we thought, oh, grass-fed, cows and stuff, and the milk is going to be like, you know, organic milk, and it's going to be bigger. She was like, girl, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like grass, like in my big <laughs> Girl, what are you doing? So anyway, yes, you're talking about like growing cannabis and like putting cannabis in a bakery. But here's the problem. This is what I learned. This is why policy is so important. And so right now, um, cannabis can only be sold through dispensaries, right? And, and, and it can only be sold to people, I don't know how it is in New York, but in, but in Michigan, with people with like medicinal cards and they have to go to dispensaries in order to get it. And I heard, that what right now was holding up legislation in order to open up the cannabis market in Michigan wide open is Big Pharma and RJ Nabisco. They want to write the policy around how to grow it, who's going to own the industry, who's going to own the fields. And I thought to myself, this is nothing but systemic and institutional racism all over again. That's Shutting true. out entrepreneurs like who have this, these brilliant ideas and how to be a part of what I would call the new future of food. It is more than just growing, and there's nothing wrong with growing, growing tomatoes and carrots and potatoes. Listen, I, I get that. But there are entrepreneurs who are thinking far beyond that. They're thinking far beyond that. They're thinking about not only soil to grow, but they're thinking about hydroponics, right? They're thinking about how to grow inside. And so you're absolutely right. But if we aren't exposing these young people, if there's not policy out there to support these entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs of color, like we're going to be shutting them out of another billion dollar industry. Right. And I need and if I'm just speaking for myself, KB, you can go ahead and touch on this. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is that I need the support. And Ingrid, you know this, but. I need, and I'm just going to speak for Davida because I can't speak for anybody else, like the support of like local, our local officials. And we need we, statewide officials and federal officials so that we can start to shape and create policy of what we want to see our cities look like in the future. Like not right now. Because we beyond like rooftop garden in Detroit. Like we're beyond, not, like we, seriously, we, we beyond all of that now. We're really thinking about new and innovative ways on how to not only grow food, but we're really starting to think about what the food is going to be of tomorrow. And we don't have the support. I'm just we, telling you that right we're now. We're also, we're addressing that in Oaksterdam, I mean Oakland. <laughs> um, so in, in Oakland, uh, in terms of the policy around medicinal marijuana, um, they, are, they are allocating licenses for dispensaries for people of color. They have set aside uh, a certain number of licenses specifically for that. Um, and my daughter has applied policy, for one. Though. That's policy that you're talking about. That's the policy. You know, uh, I have adult children, by the way. Um, and so your daughter has applied for one. Yes, yeah, she's 30, she's 31 years old. Um, so, so that's one piece. In terms of, in terms of, yeah, you know, I mean, our, in terms of how we're addressing climate change and resilient communities, um, when you see, you know, the people who, who are, you know, really frontline suffering from some of these natural disasters, you know, for the most part, it's the poorest people suffer the most. So it's an economic, it's an economic piece. Uh, so what we're trying to do in, in at Red Bay is, you know, in our little piece in, in terms of creating a model is tr trying to create some more economic justice model where, where folks are, one, they're getting paid more so they could create s situations and be more resilient for their families and, and just live in a safer environment. Um, you know, and part of, part of doing that is not just paying them a bit more, but also trying to get them to think, think like entrepreneurs and start their own businesses. Um, so part of even at the, at, the, at the shipping container business we have, since some of their revenue is tied into the profits, now all of a sudden, instead of just clocking in and clocking out and they know how much they're going to make, they're invested in how to, how to make that business make more money. Um, so we have monthly meetings around marketing, around, you know, how, how do you upsell, how do you, you know, how do you run a business 
to generate greater profits. Uh, one, you know, um, in terms of our product, we've got one product, and it's coffee. And coffee is, you know, grown around the world in a lot of very vulnerable communities. And it's a coffee is a vulnerable pr um, product, agricultural product. It is, you know, it's a commodity, so it it, it fluctuates, um, and and it's a volatile commodity that could change. So we're doing, you know, some of the same things we're doing here. You know, uh, we're we're finding ways to support our farmers in order to make them more resilient. For instance, you know, today the commodity price for coffee is about $1.41. With fair trade coffee, you know, they'll add 50 cents. So now 50 cents will go back to the farm, to their co-op or their family farm, and they're able to spend that 50 cents how they want. So that's like $1.91 a pound. So for $1.91 under a fair trade uh, system, those farmers are incentivized to grow more coffee. Um, at Red Bay Coffee, what we do is we have direct trade relationships with 90% of our farms. Um, and what that means is, is we're able to, one, influence the processes on, on how they grow their coffee. Um, but we're, we're also able to incentivize them to grow better quality coffee, and we do that by paying them more money. The average price that we pay is $3.30 per pound. So we're almost doubling, no, we're greater than doubling the commodity price, but we're doing that for them to pick only the, coffee is a fruit, it grows on a shrub, it, it, the fruit is called a cherry. The, the pit of that cherry is the coffee bean. Now, generally when, you know, most of the coffee is ripe, it's red. When most of it is red, they just harvest the whole thing. It's cheap and it's efficient, or that's the cheapest and most efficient way to do it. Um, we incentivize them to grow, pick only, harvest the red cherries only. Um, and, you know, it takes more work. They have to go through two or three passes. Um, but they could take pride in growing quality, and they're also getting paid to do that. So, so with, and they're also able to hold on to their land as well, um, right? So even when the price, the general commodity price dips below a certain livable wage, you know, it's, it's not untypical for coffee farmers to abandon their farms. Mm -hmm. It's just not even worth it for them to harvest the coffee. You know, um, so, so what, that's, that's why we're sort of work doing the work that we're doing is one, they could hold on to the land. Um, and when the uh, environmental climate challenges happen, they're able to be more resilient at that time. So I think we have time for just one more question. Is there anybody who hasn't had a chance to share or have a question? Uh, I just wanted to echo, thank you very much so far for all, the conversation has been really incredible and, and inspiring. Um, I'm, I'm actually wondering um, from a school, scholastically, uh, from an education standpoint, um, especially youth education, high school, grade school, uh, I haven't heard that talked about as much. Um, what is some of the connections in Detroit, in, in, in California, to what, what's your mindset related to the kind of educational infrastructure, uh, getting some of these ideas uh, you know, beyond just uh, the business model or the, 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 the genius entrepreneur that has a really good idea, but even into like a core curriculum or something that's for the, for the youth. How, how's that getting, how are you thinking about that? Detroit perspective um, and what I'll, what I'll say is I'm going to echo a sentiment that I said earlier and that is you you can't build it um, and expect for them to come there's been numerous there's a word that um, I just have a complete visceral reaction to um, because it really is based around like the solution is all about economics when it's not. And that word is food desert. Like I have a total visceral reaction to it because um, it a word that really came out of um, academia and it has been um, used as an economic development ploy for um, supermarkets, usually corporate based supermarkets 
to get what's called new market tax credits to create um, supermarkets in um, what they call these food desert areas. And studies now have shown that those supermarkets that have opened grocery stores that have opened in those communities have done nothing to change like the dietary like um, challenges or the health risk in those communities at all, right? And it is because you cannot just build a grocery store and a supermarket without that very much so educational component, that, that educational piece. Because if you put a supermarket there without the educational component, period, the kids go for the hot Doritos all the time, right? Or that busy single mother who's like maybe, you know, working two jobs or this and the other, and she's like just trying to like get food on the table, like she may go for the processed meat, right? Or I was at the farm just recently and I was with a young, with a young, uh, he was in middle school. I was, what's, what is uh, sixth grade? Is that middle school? Is that elementary? That's middle school, right? And he said to me, he said, Miss DeVita, what is that you're holding in your hand? And I said, this? And he said, yeah, what's that? And I said, this is a sweet potato. Like, he was kind of like, oh, this is what sweet potatoes look like? I said, well, yeah, where did you think sweet potatoes came from? Do you like sweet potato pie? He said, sweet potato pie is my favorite. I love sweet potato pie. I said, well, where do you think the sweet potatoes pie, the sweet potato came from? He said, I thought sweet potatoes came in a can. Like, saying, like, no, seriously, that's what he thought. And so that, so here's the thing. And so when I talked to, when I said and brought this uh, slide up earlier and I said that Detroit has over 1,500 community farms farms like that I mean or, or community gardens like or it's though no, it's 1500 gardens like that number is like that's impressive like it's 1500 gardens in Detroit but a large majority of that 1500 is like family farms or family gardens in people's home and so that 1500 is broken down and not only family gardens but school gardens community gardens and something that we call market gardens like that's the entrepreneurial piece but here's the most important thing that's impressive like 1,500 gardens, but what's even more impressive, that during the season, over 50,000 Detroiters are engaged in urban agriculture. Like that's the learning component right there. When you get the babies out in the farms doing internships with an organization called Keep Growing Detroit. When you get the babies in their schoolyard, you know, I, we had reached out uh, to a good friend of mine. We wanted to bring him on too, Kiba. His name is Ron Finley, and they called him the gangster gardener. And Ron said, when kids grow tomatoes, kids, eat tomatoes, right? Ron is famous for saying that. And that is the educational component. If you have a child who has a relationship with food and, and grow that food, they will eat it and be curious about it. So everything that, that even though I'm talking about um, entrepreneurship, like building businesses, I love what Kiba said is that where we try to train the entrepreneurs, the business owners, is how are you educating the consumer? How are you educating the staff? And let me tell you something. And I say this because my goddaughter is nine years old now. Uh, she lives um, in Harlem. Oh, I'm sure she lives in the Bronx now. Uh, she goes and dances at uh, Harlem School of Arts. And she has been uh, probably a vegetarian since she was six years old, right? I blame a lot of that because whoever let her see Food Inc., I don't even know what, like, who lets a six year old watch that? And she's just kind of like to her brother Lance, you know, you're eating a cow, right? That hamburger, like a cow died for you to eat that. Like, I don't eat that. But the only reason why I, I say that is because what is so important is that the number one influencers on parents are their kids. If you can get the children, you can get the parent. And so Keep Growing Detroit is an organization that works with young people. Detroit Food Academy is another um, organization in Detroit that works with young people. And we have schools in the city of Detroit that use gardening um, as a part of the curriculum in their program. So yes, that is, I don't do that work, but there are organizations who do that work um, in Detroit. Do you got anything to say about the young, young people? Um, no, not a lot. I mean, we, we, do, we do tours. So, you know, we, we, there's a lot of uh, charter schools in our neighborhood. Um, so the teachers are drinking coffee. So, so then they come in and, <laughs> and they like to see sort of the open manufacturing and the equipment and the tasting going on. And so they bring their children to, to see, you know, um, on, on tours, you know, but I, I will ask this. I'm always curious uh, when we get a room full of people, you know, I mean, now you guys know so much about us, but I'm a little curious of who's in the room. 
Can I get a show of hand for the educators in the room? Mm -hmm. Can I get a show of hand for uh, like food activists, food justice, justice people? <laughs> Can I get a show of hands for uh, entrepreneurs and business people? Um, can I get a show of hand for the uh, white supremacists in the room? <laughs> Where's my white supremacist at? I mean, uh, what, what, what about artists, designers? People the artists, designers? Yeah. The there they are. Oh, there they are. The museum. Yeah, yeah, We're the design museum. Exactly. Of course. Yep, 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 yeah. Yep. All right, cool. Well, thank yeah. you guys so much. Yes. Thank Yay. you. Thank you.